I do think it is very outdated. Um, there are so many things wrong with this world today that aren't addressed in the Bible. I mean, I've definitely, you know, had good experiences with the Bible. Um, it's, you know, it's a beautiful book. When you say you don't believe in the Bible, well, I believe in the Bible. Yeah, it, it happened. Well, some of it, but <laughs> uh, you know, all legend is based on truth, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it happened, uh, but I believe it is just that, the legend. You look at the Bible and there's fantastical stories that I can't bring myself to believe. Just the way that in the New Testament Jesus uses parables to relay lessons, I feel like that's the way that lots of the stories in the Bible are. They're not necessarily truth, they're a story meant to convey a principle or a way to live your life. You know, without a doubt, I think there's historical correctness to it. There's also fable. Um, so there's lots and lots of good lessons in the Bible, but there's also outdated principles and things that I don't think can apply to our modern world and the world that we live in now. What I use the Bible for is, is as a good moral guide. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the, there's a lot of good lessons within the Bible, but it's not the absolute truth by any means. Like we were mentioning, there are good things, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are pretty uh, pretty much going to stand for time as guidelines that I think you should live by, you know? It does have good morals. It's a good storybook. I don't believe 100% everything came from God. I believe it's like a compilation of multiple people's perceptions of stories that they heard or witnessed possibly themselves. And how long have we had the Bible? It's been around for hundreds of years, so, and not originally in English either, so. Yeah. A lot can be lost in translation from long ago, like those words may not mean the same that they mean today, yeah. and changing of languages too, so. It's like playing telephone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. some can be lost there. A lot of times you can be having a discussion and it, your question isn't answered with, you know, a response from someone's heart and their mind. It's just a recited scripture. Um, you know, maybe they've heard a pastor answer a question with this scripture in the past and so they just immediately snap to that and they say well the Bible says but if the Bible is not truth to me then what does it matter what the Bible says what do you think I have so enjoyed this room for doubt series not just studying for it. I've thoroughly enjoyed that. I enjoyed sitting through last week's message as Jake Smith preached that powerful message. I've just enjoyed everything about this. Listen, where there are good questions, there can and should be good, even better, answers. We don't uh, have to run from doubt. We can run toward doubt. We can even attack doubt. The Bible makes a truth claim of itself in the book of Psalms. It says, your word, if we were reading out of John's dad's Bible, it would say, thy word, in the King James translation. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. It illuminates even my life for me. I want to lean into Scripture today. The title of the message is, Isn't the Bible Full of Myths and Mistakes? And perhaps you have had similar conversations to the interview that we just listened in on. Listen, before we dive too deep into this topic, I just want to remind you that each week as we're doing this, we have a texting number. Do me a favor. If you have a question, maybe it's on this topic of the Bible, maybe it's on anything, any room for doubt kind of a question, simply text that to 317-689-8576. We want to interact with you. We want to make sure you have good answers to your good questions. Or maybe you would like to interact with some of these topics together in a group setting. If that's you, and I would urge you to be a part of this, text group to that same number. Just the word group and we'll get you connected into that. Okay, I referenced a book as we talk and as we think about the Bible. And we need to answer those good questions that skeptics are asking. I, uh, I mentioned a book two weeks ago, a book by Mark Middleberg. It's called The Reason Why Faith Makes Sense. I want to read to you a story he shares in that book. He shows up in a college philosophy class. Maybe you can relate to what's going on inside his heart and his mind. He says this, I felt 
like I was in way over my head. As a business major, I wasn't sure I should even be trying to interact with what seemed at the time to be such lofty and out-of-reach ideas about knowledge, truth, and faith. Then, one day, our professor stood up and systematically challenged what he called the traditional view of God. He proclaimed that the concept of an eternal, unchanging, all-powerful God was based on ideas from a book, the Bible, that was written by hopelessly flawed human beings had been edited and embellished over time, and was full of factual errors and contradictions. Maybe you sat through a class like this. I wanted to refute what the professor was saying, but the thought of getting up and challenging this learned teacher made my knees grow weak and my mouth grow dry. Worse yet, I realized I didn't really know what to say. I didn't agree with him, but I didn't know how to refute his claims. I felt intimidated and spiritually insecure. Can you relate to that? I've had moments like that myself. Maybe you've had a conversation with a skeptical friend, maybe with a relative who has not yet crossed the line of faith, or maybe somebody at work who knows that you believe, but they belittled you because of your trust in the Bible and told you it was a book filled with myths and mistakes. Come on, maybe they taunted you. Nobody really believes that stuff anymore. If you leave those challenges unaddressed, they're going to fester in your mind and in your heart. Waves of doubt can come over you. We have to answer those questions. Again, where there are good good questions, there are always good answers. I've got great news. We have great reason to believe that the Bible is reliable and that it represents truth with authority. I would stake my life on it. We're going to talk about a few of those today. I want to focus mainly on the New Testament today simply for the purposes of time management. There is a lot to cover on this topic, so I want to laser focus on the New Testament. Here are four main questions maybe you've had these posed to you when we think about the authority of Scripture. Here's a question. How do we know that the New Testament is actually reliable history? I wonder if some of us have interacted with that question. We should have an answer for that. How about this question? How can intelligent people believe in a book of miracles? That's a great question. We should have a great answer for that. How about this question? How do we address apparent contradictions in the Bible? You should be prepared to answer that question because if you haven't gotten it yet, listen, these questions are escalating. We ought to be prepared to give a good answer for our faith. How about this question? How can we trust a book that has been translated and retranslated? This is a common one floating out there, and we're going to address that. So basically, the flow of this message is I want to address a form of each of these questions that a skeptic similar to the interview that we just watched. A skeptic might pose of you, or maybe you are a skeptic, and you're posing these questions of yourself. Well, there are good answers to your good questions. And so for each of these, we want to look at the question that a skeptic might pose, and then we're going to share with you a good answer. That's the flow of the message. Are you ready? Here we go. The first question is this one. Skeptics sometimes say the New Testament was written too late to be reliable history. I wonder if you've gotten this question. This one kind of permeates out there. I hear it quite often. Have you heard that claim? People will say, well, didn't you know that the New Testament wasn't even written until like a century or maybe even two centuries after the time of Christ? They're wrong. It was not. But this is one of those like persistent lies that just permeates and we have to wrestle with it. Listen, if this were true, I would struggle with it. But it's simply not true. You can know that it's not true. The Bible, the New Testament, is based primarily, those who wrote the New Testament, God spoke through them, and it's based primarily on direct eyewitness testimony. You can take that to the bank. For example, the Apostle John, who wrote the book of John, he wrote three epistles to the church, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He also wrote the book of Revelation. We talked about John in a sermon series just a few months ago. This is what he says at the beginning of 1st John. He just kind of lays it out there. He says, this is who I am and what I'm about. This which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. He's an eyewitness. 
which we've looked at, and our hands have touched, this, this is what we proclaim. Listen, that's John, eyewitness. There are other parts of the New Testament that were written that were compiled by writers who got their information directly from eyewitnesses. For example, Luke. Luke is a physician, and oh my goodness, Luke's gospel is so detailed. I love the detail with which he approaches the topic. In Luke chapter 1, he makes it a point of explaining his research methodology. He approaches this similarly to the way an investigative reporter would approach it. He says this, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. We've seen some amazing things happen. A whole bunch of people have been writing about this. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. They went straight to the source. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, he's saying, listen, I'm invested in this process. I also have decided to write a, I love this word, careful account. Why? So you can be certain, certain, of the truth of everything you were taught. I'm setting out, he's saying in his own words, to prove it. I'm being careful so that you can be certain. It's clear that these writers are making the claim that they were eyewitnesses to the actual events, or at a minimum, they obtained their information from those who were the actual eyewitnesses. Their accounts were also, you need to know this, they were written down early soon after the events happened. It's now widely accepted, even among skeptical historians, that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were all written within the first century A.D. We have strong reasons to believe that most of the New Testament was written down, check this out, by A.D. 70. As a matter of fact, New Testament scholar Craig Blomberg, he explains this. He says, and I'm I'm reading here what he says. He quotes, the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, ends apparently unfinished. Paul is a central figure of the book, and he's under house arrest in Rome. With that, the book abruptly halts. Well, what happened to Paul? We don't find out from Acts, probably because the book was written before Paul was put to death. Then he goes on and he says this, and I want you to see this. That means Acts cannot be dated any later than A.D. 62. If you're doing some math in your head, well, this is important. I'll total it up for you here in just a minute. Having established that, we can then uh, move backward from there. Since Acts is the second of a two-part work, we know that the first part, the Gospel of Luke, we just read from that, must have been written earlier than that. And since Luke incorporates parts of the Gospel of Mark, that means that Mark is even earlier than that. If you allow maybe a year for each of those, you end up with the Gospel of Mark being written no later than A.D. 60, maybe even in the late 50s. So if Jesus was put to death in A.D. 30 or 33, we're talking about a maximum gap of 30 years or so. This is a big deal. He goes on and says this, historically speaking, that's like a news flash. It really is. Then he adds, the Gospels were written after almost all the letters of Paul, whose writing ministry probably began in the late 40s. Most of his major letters appeared during the 50s. We go on, he says, to read that Paul incorporated creeds and confessions of faith and hymns from the earliest Christian church. These go all the way back to the dawning of the church soon after the resurrection. And he says that one of those creeds, we're going to look at that next week, was probably written just two years after Jesus' crucifixion. Scholars have attacked this for a while. There's like this permeating lie that the Bible, the New Testament, was written much later than it actually was. It's not true. It was written very close to the time. The earliest letters of Paul were written, check this out, within 25 years of the resurrection. And other major books like Mark, Luke, and Acts were written within 40 years of the resurrection. Historically, that's just not a very long time. I was sitting in a meeting not long ago. And uh, I had a bunch of our staff in the same room, and um, we were talking about kind of events that have happened. And 9-11, how many of you remember 
One of my staff kind of confessed that uh, he was very little when 9-11 happened. In that moment, I felt like an old man because I vividly remember 9-11. I remember one of my, well, my firstborn right there with me, and so I was a dad already at that point. And then I got to thinking about this. I said this later to my wife, to Dawn. I said, their 9-11, this younger generation, their 9-11 is my Vietnam. It happened before I was born, and it felt like ancient history to me, but it happened just before I was born. And then I got to thinking about this. Check this out. I am only one person removed from the eyewitness stories of the Civil War. Let me tell you how. My grandpa, my grandpa, was born in 1896. Old grandpa, right? I remember sitting on his knee when I was a little boy. He was a World War I veteran. My grandpa learned stories of the Civil War from eyewitnesses, from people that were there. I'm only one person removed from the Civil War. It's a blip in history. My kids are one person removed from stories of World War I because my grandpa told me stories about it and I can tell them stories about it. This period of time between the New Testament, the events that happened and the eyewitnesses recording it and writing it down, this is a blip in history. Friends, you can be convinced on this one. Before we go into the next topic of questions that skeptics would ask, can we just briefly address the idea of lost gospels? How many of you have heard of the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas? They've gotten a whole bunch of play over the last 20 years, I would say, like on the History Channel and things like that. It seems like every year around Easter, somebody puts out another documentary about the Gospel of Thomas. And people kind of push on this, and, and they ask questions about this. Hey, can you, uh, how do you prove this to be authentic? And you can ask them. Literally, you could ask them, if they're talking about one of these Gospels, false Gospels, the lost Gospels, the Gnostic Gospels, you could ask them, authenticate what? What are you asking me to authenticate? These lost Gospels, rather, were late forgeries that only claimed to be Gospels. These were written actually 100 years later or even 150 years later. There's a reason why... The editors that put together your Bible, what made it into, here's a fancy word, the canon of Scripture, those false gospels didn't make the cut. There was a rigorous set of standards to make it into the cut of Scripture, included, including the idea this need to be eyewitnesses who record the events in real time. You can be confident of that. So, you can confidently answer the skeptic question, wasn't it written too late to be reliable history? Well, the New Testament was written early, and it presents reliable historical accounts of God's activities through Christ. You can answer that with confidence. Here's the second question that skeptics might say. They might ask of you this, the Bible is full of myths and stories of miracles that can no longer be believed by thinking people. Right? Well, you can answer that. If there's a good question, you better believe there's a good answer. You might be able to ask them, well, have you actually investigated the evidence for or against these things and concluded for yourself that they didn't happen, or are you just leaning on hearsay yourself? You see, because when you do that, you're actually leaning into what we would call an anti-God bias. You're already biased toward the idea that these things can't be true. This is anti-supernatural presupposition. To put it more simply, it's just good old-fashioned prejudice against Christian truth claims. Last week, we looked at some amazing evidence. Jake Smith preached, and he talked about how our God is an intelligent designer. He created the universe. He spoke it into existence, and then he fine-tuned it to a razor's edge of precision so that life could exist. We looked at the cause behind that. We talked about a moral lawgiver. If you missed that message, I would urge you to go back and to check it out, to watch it. The Bible talks a fair about, about miracles, not just the world being spoken into existence, but beyond that, there's a lot of powerful evidence in the Bible. There are amazing prophecies that were fulfilled in detail hundreds of years later. I talked about some of this during our Easter sermon. 
I looked at a couple passages that week. I'll remind you of these right now. Isaiah chapter 53 gives a detailed description of crucifixion 700 years before the time of Christ. When the writer of Isaiah says of Jesus, 700 years from now we'll be pierced for our iniquities. Crucifixion hadn't even been invented at that point. Psalm 22, which was written about a thousand years before the time of Christ, describes Jesus' crucifixion in detail where it says this, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and they cast lots for my garments. Vivid detail about crucifixion. A thousand years. Crucifixion hasn't even been invented yet. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 predicts that the Messiah, Messiah would come from Bethlehem. That's exactly where Jesus was born. And yes, Jesus really did heal people. He cast out demons, he walked on water, and he turned water into wine. One of the evidences I would point to that is this. None of his enemies denied that he actually did those things. You can see this buried in the text. You can see this even in the way they addressed him, his enemies as they related to him. For example, he's in trouble with the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 12, verse 9. I want you to look at this language. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Notice, They don't push back on that he really did heal the man. They recognize that as truth. They see the evidence with their own eyes. Rather, they attack him. They poke at him. Well, should you be doing that on Saturday? Should you be doing that on the Sabbath? His enemies, they recognize that a miracle happened there. By the way, these stories of miracles are confirmed not just by your New Testament, but they were confirmed by secular history. For example... Many of the New Testament claims were later reinforced by outside reports, such as people like like these, Thallus, Tacitus, Josephus. He's a Jewish historian that's a big deal in confirming New Testament claims. There are all kinds of secular, outside the Christian faith, folks that are agreeing with this. According to historian Gary Habermas, he he wrote a book called The Historical Jesus. He said this, There are at least 39 ancient sources outside of the Bible that provide over 100 facts about Jesus' life, teachings, death, and resurrection. I grew up in the church, much much like John described in his communion meditation. I grew up hearing fantastic stories of miraculous things that happened, including one of my favorites, David and Goliath. How many of you grew up hearing stories of a giant and a sling and a little shepherd boy and five little stones? And You know the story. I went to the Holy Land several years ago and my faith grew when I got to stand in the spot. It's called the Elah Valley where David killed Goliath. There's been this story and uh, been circulating for a long time. Archaeology has undergirded this in some ways. For example, let me show you 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 52. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines after David killed Goliath to the entrance of Gath, this is the Philistine city, and to the gates of Ekron, another Philistine city. Their dead were strewn along the Sha'arim road to Gath and Ekron. The problem, until about 12 years ago, they couldn't figure out well, where is Sha'arim? They tried to make it metaphorical. They hadn't found that city. And then they were doing some digging, like happens in the, in the Holy Land all the time. They were digging up water or something like that, and they found evidence of a city, and they started dating it, and they took bones, and they did carbon-14 dating and all that kind of stuff. I got to be there a few years ago, walking around in Sha'arim. I actually found this. It's a, a piece of a clay pot. It's the handle of a clay pot. And just finding that, by the way, Sha'arim, I've got some pictures here. Sha'arim means two gates. They found this city, a circular city at the top of the hill overlooking the Elah Valley. It had, get this, two gates. These are some of the holes right here where one of those gates was planted. How cool is that? Archaeological evidence that grows my 
faith. Skeptics were looking at the Bible and saying, I don't know, maybe I can poke holes at this story even with the, we can't find that city that's mentioned there. Friends, the Bible is not a book of myths. Rather, it's filled with verifiable facts that you can examine and you can confirm, and I believe you can stake your life upon. So you can answer confidently. The Bible is not full of myths, but it does tell about the amazing ways God worked through Jesus, including fulfilled prophecies and miracles. Well, skeptics ask questions. There should be a good answer to a good question. How about this question? Skeptics would say this, number three, the Bible can't be trusted because it's full of contradictions. Doesn't it even contradict itself? Really? Chock full of contradictions? Maybe you could ask the skeptic, well, can you show me a few of the ones that bother you the most? Oftentimes, people won't point to anything because they're just kind of repeating what they've heard from somebody else. But then sometimes people will have specific passages that they can point to. And listen, we should have good answers to their good questions. For example, sometimes people will point, hey, there's accounts of the resurrection. And one author describes there's two angels at the tomb. And one author says there's only one angel at the tomb. Well, which is it? Is it one or is it two? Or maybe they'll point to a story like when Jesus, and we looked at this just a few weeks ago, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Well, one biblical author says there's one donkey. Another says there are two donkeys. Well, which is it, one or two? How can I even trust a book if it's written by people who couldn't even count angels or donkeys, right? To which I would point back to them what I would call a helpful rule of math. By the way, you can take this one to the bank. Wherever there are two, there is also one. I mean, you're being hypercritical here of was it two or was it one? Well, if there were two, there is also one. For example, I could go home today and I could tell Dawn, I saw a guy in church today that was wearing a red sweater. And she could push back and say, well, was it one guy wearing a red sweater or was it multiple guys wearing a red sweater? Well, if we used to live in Bloomington, and if it was especially a home game weekend, I said, well, there were a ton of guys wearing a red sweater. But just because I'm saying that there's one doesn't mean that I'm lying or misrepresenting the truth. I'm just talking about the one that I saw. You get what I'm saying here? Many of those contradictions about Scripture, so-called contradictions, they come down to an eyewitness report and just selectively what they choose to share. Minor discrepancies. It does not take away from the miracle of the resurrection. Every good question has a good answer. We only have time to scratch the surface of this today, but I just want to remind you that the Bible has been affirmed over and over and over again. You can scratch away at that. There are good answers to good questions. I've touched on it briefly. We don't have a lot of time today to get into the rich subject of archaeology, but over and over and over again, archaeology has proven the Bible account. There was a guy named Sir William Ramsey. He was a professor at Cambridge University. He did this exhaustive study of archaeology and laid it against the New Testament, and he looked specifically at the book of Luke, and he said this, Luke has correctly identified 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands without error. That's a big deal. Did I mention that he was an atheist? And then he shocked the academic world when he gave up his atheism and he put his faith in Christ because evidence demands a verdict. By the way, Bible translators were aware of these details. Those who took the original Greek language and put it into the vernacular of the day, they took great pains to preserve the truth. For example... One of our heroes of the faith is a guy named Jerome. Jerome, his task was to take the Greek New Testament, the Greek Bible, and translate it into the vernacular of the day, Latin, that the Roman world spoke. Early Bible translator. I got to hang out in his office several years ago. This is so cool. This is a statue of Jerome. His Greek name is Hieronymus. Hieronymus. 
This is actually his office where that first translation from Greek to Latin took place. Guess where he did that? On location. His office is underneath the church of the nativity in Bethlehem. Why? Well, because he moved from Rome to the Holy Land because he wanted to do his translation of Scripture in context. He wanted to smell the air. He wanted to spend time with the descendants of the people who were the original eyewitnesses because he put so much value into making sure it was correct. You can answer confidently. The Bible is not full of contradictions, and most of the alleged discrepancies are pretty easily answered. But skeptics might push back, and they'll say, how about this question, number four, the Bible has been corrupted over time, right? Hasn't it? You even heard it in the, sto- in, the, in, in the interview that we listened to just a bit ago. We watched. You heard somebody reference the telephone game. You know, this, listen, this, you whisper to somebody, and they whisper to somebody else, and by the time you get to the end of the telephone, it doesn't even resemble what the message started with. Isn't this what's happened with Scripture? Listen, my favorite gossip illustration, the telephone game, is not a good metaphor for Bible translation. That's not how Scripture was translated. They didn't start with Greek and Jerome translates it to Latin and then the next person takes the Latin and translates it to German and then German translated to English. That's not how this worked. Actually, I would say this, every good translation goes back to the earliest and best documents. And by the way, We find newer documents still as we do archaeology, as the world shrinks. We find newer documents. This is why even the NIV during my lifetime, it was working with one set of codexes when it did its first translation in like 1978. And there have been additions and changes even through the years, not just to connect with uh, modern language changes, but because we found earlier documents and we're trying to get the best and most accurate translation. This is a big deal especially when you compare it to other works of antiquity. Daniel B. Wallace, a New Testament scholar, says this. He says, an embarrassment of riches is what we find for Bible translators. Compared to the data the classical Greek and Latin scholars have to contend with, like if you wanted to translate the Iliad, the Odyssey, and some other works from antiquity, the average classical author's literary, or, uh, author's literary remains numbered no more than 20 copies. We have about 20 copies of the Iliad. Well, what do you do with that? By comparison, he says, there are more than 5,800 copies of early Greek manuscripts of our New Testament. 20 to 5,080. And then he says, there are about 20,000 more in other languages. He goes on, he does the math, he says, we have more than 1,000 times the manuscript data for the New Testament than we have for the average Greco-Roman author. Not only this, but the manuscripts of the average classical author are no earlier than 500 years after the time of the original author. That's a big deal. What did we say earlier? About 25 to 40 years. For the New Testament, we were waiting mere decades for surviving copies. That's a big deal. You can take that to the bank. The bottom line is that the modern translations of the Bible available to us today are accurate and trustworthy renditions of the original biblical text. You can read them with great confidence that what they say is what they originally meant. Occasionally people will push back to me and say, well, what about textual variants? We're getting into the weeds a little bit here. But I want to show this to you. This is the original Greek language, the Greek New Testament. This, of course, is not an original manuscript, but this is a compilation of those original manuscripts. That's a picture in my office, by the way. You're wondering, why in the world does our pastor have Dewey Decimal System stuff on his books in the library? Well, without going into detail about that story, I went away on spring break years ago as a youth pastor with a bunch of my students on a mission trip, and I came back and found myself victim to an overzealous church librarian. 
That's what happened there. But this is the Greek text, and these are what are called textual variants. One codex does not match with another codex, and skeptics push back on that and say, look at all of those different variables. Well, I would be quick to point out, except for glaring errors that we acknowledge quickly, like the ending of the book of Mark. There's a smooth ending to a rough ending of the book of Mark that we have to confess Somebody came back later, some well-meaning scribe, and smoothed out the rough ending of the book of Mark. But if you you have a study Bible, it's going to say that right there. We acknowledge that right up front. Most, omitting that one, most of the textual variants land somewhere in the C and D ratings. They're not A and B ratings. They're not major deals. Most oftentimes, the textual variants that we find there are a misplaced punctuation or a breathing mark that got put over this letter instead of over this letter. So you can answer confidently. Hear me. The Bible has not been corrupted over time. The Bibles we have today are highly accurate and reliable versions of what was originally written. Four questions. Four good answers. I heard a quote this past week. I love this quote. I've been chewing on this all week. 99 will read the Bible. One will read the Christian. We talked this morning already about your one. You have one life to invest. Who's the one life you're investing in? There are good answers for skeptics about the authority of Scripture. There are good answers to those questions. But as you interact with your one, it's probably more important, at least initially, they might be reading you more than they're reading the Bible. And your confidence in Holy Scripture telegraphs volumes to them. Let's start there. So can the Bible be trusted? Well, let's start there. Let's also end there. Can it be trusted? Overwhelmingly, I would stake my life on it. Yes, it can be. The evidence tells us overwhelmingly it can be trusted. Not just us, but check this out. Jesus trusted Scripture. He endorses Old Testament Scripture. He said it in his own teachings. Look at this in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You also need to know this. Our church trusts the Bible. I trust the Bible in my own life. You can trust the Bible in your own life. As a matter of fact, this is one of our five core values. We believe in biblical authority. We don't stand on Scripture. Rather, we want to live our lives under Scripture. Its authority permeates everything we do. It's a big deal. You won't benefit from it, though, by osmosis. You can't put your hand on it or lay your head down next to it and absorb what it has to offer. This is a sad statement that George Gallup has said this. Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. We revere it, but we don't read it. So let me end today with this challenge. Pick up a Bible this week. Might I suggest the Gospel of John would be a great place for you to start. Read about what Jesus has done. Read it with authority. Choose to live under its authority. Taste it and see. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So as we wrap this up, can I just end where we started? We talked about texting. If you want to join a group, text group to that number. If you have questions, text the same number. Any question, maybe something I said stirs up something in you, we'd love to respond and get into that question. Every good question has a good answer. If you want to spend more time on this topic, hit that website. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago. Hit it, roomfordoubt.com. There's all kinds of great content there on these topics for you to wrestle with and for you to explore. As the worship team comes out, I want to wrap up this sermon simply with a thought. I shared with you just a bit ago that Sha'ariam, walking around that space, grew my faith. 
some Israelite. A thousand years before Jesus, so 3,000 years my senior, likely touched this, interacted with this material. It became water, a vessel probably to hold water to sustain life. That's pretty cool. It grows my faith, even finding that, knowing that that stand that holds the Bible up. But I'll tell you this, more than that, knowing that the respect that Bible translators have poured into this document, knowing that it has the power to change my life, that it is literally the Word of God, this grows my faith. But this, this grows my faith. The question is, are you letting it do that for you today? I want to respond with worship right now. Would you stand up with me? We're going to respond. As we step into this next week that we live before our God, we want to live our lives authentically before him. Step boldly into the week that he has in store for us. Would you step into that with the word of God? Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to study and be studied by your words. I thank you for your holy scriptures. I thank you that there are good answers to good questions. And as we respond, as we lean in right now, grow our faith. And it's in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.